If you are thinking about writing a book, you're definitely gonna wanna stick around for this video because as someone who has published a book before and has worked with people who have published books for both fiction and nonfiction authors, I've got a lot of stuff to say about what the other side looks like. Once you get that almighty book deal, if that's something that you're going for, things to be aware of, expectations to have, um, just the stuff that I don't feel like new aspiring authors always know about. It can be a little harsh, so just to help save you time, headaches, and especially disappointment appointment later on down the road. I just want to be as transparent as possible about what the industry, what the book business thinks and how they approach your book ideas. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Now, who is this chick on the internet giving me unsolicited advice about what to do with my creative endeavors? Well, I myself have written and traditionally published a number one Amazon best-selling book through a small press here based in Chicago. Um, I've also helped launch books for high dollar clients through an Inc. 5000 marketing agency. And now I work with authorpreneurs to market their books, to market their businesses ultimately. So I've been on both sides, both as the creative pursuing the book deal and also as the person on the other side marketing books that have been published, whether self-published or traditionally published. So that's a little bit about me and kind of why I'm qualified to talk about this and all the expertise and knowledge that I have to share. So generally, when you decide to write a book, this is sort of in theory how you might think of it. It's very, very simplified, right? It's easy to think of it as simply as writing it, editing it, and publishing it. And basically that is it, but there's a lot of asterisks and it depends and oh, nuances and things that are embedded in each of those three little arms. So that's kind of what I'm gonna be breaking down. So in actuality, the process is more like you get the idea to write a book, you romanticize the idea of writing your book, whether the craft and process of it, whether it be being a bestseller later on down the road or whether it be the plot of your book or your story or something. I feel like it's a good couple weeks where you're really inspired and you're sort of on this high with you know what this new book could do. So let's say that you decide to channel that into writing a new story and you're just like really invigorated by it. You start writing, you find out that it's hard and that it does require consistency. That is the thing that is gonna help you to finish a book is consistency. I don't think you need to write every day. Whatever cadence you set for yourself, do it consistently. If it's two days a week, if it's seven days a week, whatever you pick, pick it consistently. So you start writing, you find out that it's hard, and this is where you start having sort of like an on-off relationship with your book. And this is also the part where, because it becomes a lot more inconsistent and the inspiration and the romanticy of it is sort of like dying down, this is where you either dump it or push through it and finish it. So let's say that we're being optimistic in this video and you finish it. This is really exciting because in my mind, you're halfway there. If you can just bring the story into existence, I feel like that's like 50% of the work. So you have this thing on paper and it's garbage. It's going to be garbage. In the moment, you're gonna think that this first draft is pretty good. It's not pretty good, it's bad. I'm really being honest because that was my experience with my book. I was like, oh, hey, this is pretty good because you're running on a high, you finished it. But it, it's bad, it's meant to be bad. It doesn't have to be good, it just has to be written. So this is the part where you start editing and editing and editing, self-editing as much as possible, which on its own can be a very vicious cycle because it's easy to get caught up in filtering yourself as you edit. And then with each fresh day that comes with fresh eyes, you go back and look at the thing you edited previously and it's horrible and you wanna change all those errors it's a very vicious cycle. So let's say that you self-edit as much as possible, you hire out an editor, which I highly recommend doing, especially if you're wanting to self-publish, especially if you're wanting to traditionally publish, which I'll be getting into in a second. Let's say that it's as cleaned up and polished as you can possibly get it. Now you're saddled with how do I publish it? Not just the how, but which option do I want? And there's three main ones. There's self-publishing, which has risen in popularity a lot in the past decade, especially. There's traditional publishing, which is most likely what you you think of when you think of publishing is where you're working with a press and then there's sort of like a lesser known new-ish kind of hybrid option called hybrid <laughs> which is a blend of the two so in short self-publishing is DIY publishing you're doing it all yourself you retain all the rights you have complete creative control it's completely in your hands the quality is in your hands but you're also held responsible for everything copyright issues if you're borrowing images all that stuff the second option which is traditional publishing this is like the done for you model you give your book to someone to publish and you're kind of working with them as business partners, as a collaboration. And then hybrid is what it sounds like. It's a combination of the two. This is more of like a pay to publish model where you fork over 
a chunk of money to have a small team of people help you, but in exchange, you still keep the rights and majority of the royalties. So those are the three different options. And let's say that you filter it down to two. It's either traditional where you do it yourself or there's traditional where it's done for you. I'm gonna be focusing more on the traditional model because that's where a lot more nuances and specific things kind of have to happen. So let's say that you decide to pursue the traditional book publishing deal where you're working with the press. This can take years depending on what your specific goals are and what your version of success looks like. If you decide to traditionally publish with a bigger press, let's say, you're most likely going to need an agent for a representation that acts as the middleman between you and the publisher, especially if your debut, if you have no history of writing books before, no sales behind your name, which is very, very okay, you are absolutely going to need an agent if you're wanting a press that's a bit more mid-size or any of the biggest ones in the US slash the world. If you're wanting to do small press, like I did, I didn't have an agent, I was completely fine, it's all good. But I would say for bigger presses, you're gonna want an agent. That alone can take years. you have I don't know if you've heard any of those stories about JK Rowling, how many pitches she sent. I don't know if you've heard those stories about Stephen King, how many pitches he did. It's a lot of work. It is a part-time job to write a book and set yourself up for publication and pursue publication. It is a part-time job, not even counting if you have kids, if you have pets, if you work full-time, if you're in school full-time, it's a lot of work, which, you know, not only that, but there's also such a high barrier of entry when it comes to traditional publishing, which I'm gonna get into in a second. But let's say that everything checks out, it pays off, you're on a high, you're on cloud nine, you get the book deal, you get the agent and everything. This is where the inevitable pivot, as I like to call it, from the craft of writing to the business of books takes place. This is where you sort of cross that threshold and make it to the other side. Like you're in, you're in, you're in with a publisher, you have a book deal, this thing is going to be made through someone else's resources. This is where that book deal is gonna happen. You're gonna get a contract, your agent is gonna review it with you, something that they are qualified to do. If you wanna get an outside perspective, feel free. Uh, I think the Authors Guild um, is an organization that offers uh, legal support to authors and stuff if you get a membership with them. This is where you might learn, if you didn't know already, that by working with a publisher, you are signing over the rights to your book to them. It's sort of like you are your book's surrogate, if you wanna think about it that way. You're birthing it and then giving it over to another party to take care of, right? So this is where the publisher is going to be using their resources, their manpower to produce this thing, to edit this thing again, to designing it, to formatting it, to distributing it, all those things take place in-house. And because you're leaning on their resources, they are going to, to take a bigger cut of the sales because it's it's their resources that they're using to even make it in the first place. So when you sign that book deal, you're signing over your rights and in exchange, you're gonna get about 10 to 15% of those royalties on average, I would say. So in terms of very, very basic math, if your book sells for $10 at most, you'll get about a dollar and a half for every book that you sell, right? Very, very, very basic. If, if someone in the comments wants to go deeper into what all the facts and figures looks like, by all means, please do so. But generally that's what happens. And this is kind of the part where people start to feel a little disillusioned, let's say, where maybe the publisher has strong feelings on what the cover should be. Maybe they have strong feelings on what the title should be. Maybe they have strong feelings on the direction of the book. Every publisher operates differently depends on your book. There's a lot of it depends language in, in the book space because every book is different. The market fluctuates so frequently and so quickly, right? So I feel like this is where once people make it to the other side, their book is out there, maybe they didn't have the best experience. Maybe they felt like they didn't have as much of a voice. Maybe they felt like they weren't included as much. I'm not singling anyone out. I'm really not. I'm just describing what I've heard from other people that I've talked with who have been through the traditional publishing process. On top of that, if you are a newer debut author and this is your first book that you're publishing, the publisher, despite all their resources and connections that they have, may not necessarily put a large chunk of their marketing budget into your book, especially if you don't have a track record of book sales in the past. If you're brand new, like brand new, this is book one for you, you haven't done or written anything else, this is where the emphasis for marketing and promotion is going to land on your shoulders because they don't know you. They don't wanna throw their money at you and have it not pay off, right? Because books, like anything else on planet Earth, are a business. As wholesome, as cherished, as amazing as books are, they have to make money. These people wanna turn a profit. So if your book is brand new, they see that as a risk, but a risk worth taking because they're producing it. 
So that might not necessarily mean that they're going to roll out the red carpet for you and give you a full like PR campaign for New York Times bestseller or anything like that. Put put your face and your book on the on the billboards. It it might not happen that way. And a lot of authors are not only unprepared to deal with the marketing and promotion of it and the self promotion of it, but they also maybe thought that that was something that their publisher did. Maybe that was the entire basis for pursuing the traditional book deal or something. It looks different for everyone, but very very generally, that's sort of like the pivot that happens when you cross that threshold from doing this all on your own, wearing multiple hats at once, to giving it over to someone else to produce on your behalf. So this is all to say that the book business, the publishing industry, is known for being slow, old-fashioned, yet very, very prestigious because there's such a high barrier of entry, because there's so much vetting that has to happen, because it takes years to get representation if you're wanting that and a traditional book deal if you don't have any pre-existing uh, connections that can help expedite some of that process. If you are brand new, I was brand new. I had no connections. I didn't know anyone who had published a book before, so I had to figure it all out on my own. And that was one of the biggest things that I learned is that connections are everything in the book space, whether you're working as a professional or if you're you know, coming in as a first-time author, it helps so much to know people because they can open a lot of doors for you, whether, you know, big or small. So the publishing industry is slow because on average, you know, depending on who you're working with, the size of a press that you're working with, it can take anywhere from one to maybe two years to get your book produced versus self-publishing, you know, which might only take a handful of months, depending on how concerned you are with quality. It's very old fashioned. There's a lot of white people working in publishing. There have been pushes for diversity, but it still falls pretty flat. There's just not a lot of diverse perspectives in publishing. They've been trying to introduce more of that. It's still very majority white, but it's old fashioned that way. But a lot of people like it and are willing to trade the rights to their book in exchange for that prestige, in exchange to be able to say that they are associated with a certain press or that they did traditionally publish. It ultimately just depends on how much you value something like that. So they're slow, they're old fashioned, they're very prestigious, and they also care about books that will make them money. How does this happen? The goal of every publisher is to have a successful backlist title. If you're not super familiar with what that is, a backlist title or a list of older books that are about a year older or more that continue to sell, whether by word of mouth, whether by promotion on the author's end, whatever, but it's basically passive income for the publisher, right? Like who wouldn't want to have passive income? A lot of people pursue self-publishing for the same option. You get majority of the royalties, and if you're willing to put in enough of that marketing uh, and promotion on your end, you know, eventually word of mouth will kind of take off, assuming you wrote a quality book, you know, enough for it to kind of start selling itself. So whether it's for you, whether it's for your publisher, the goal is the same. People want to make money. And because a lot of publishers aren't always able to carry that marketing load on themselves, if they have big dreams, big goals, a big version of success, this is also probably the part where they might start hiring out support. Is it necessary? No. Again, just depends on what you value and how much you value it. So let's say that you get an advance from your book. It's sometimes indicative of how successful your publisher thinks your book might be. The bigger the advance, the bigger the potential it has to sell. The lower the advance, probably going to sell a little bit less. But generally, if you're wanting to have an external marketing budget, it never hurts to take about 10% of that and put it away. Maybe that goes towards hiring a PR agent or someone. Maybe that goes toward hiring a marketing strategist or a book launcher or someone like me where I'm able to do that kind of thing. Although I will say that the difference is with my line of work, I only market nonfiction authors, which is why I use authorpreneurs as the term, because it's really, really easy for an author, let's assuming that they're self-publishing or something, it's a lot easier for an author to make back that return on their investment financially if it leads into their business. Because you know, depending on how much money they spent on this book, if they can get a handful of clients as a result of that book through their business because the book funneled their attention into their brand, you know, they're gonna be able to make back that return a lot more easily and quickly than maybe someone who has, you know, published a fiction book where everything rests in the story. And I will say that this is also probably applicable for memoir as well. Um, it is a nonfiction book, but it's heavily narrative. So either way, the emphasis is gonna be on the story. Doesn't mean that you still can't have other revenue arms to help you make back that cost or to open up additional 
you know, monetary gain or something for you. If you're interested in learning more about that, you should definitely check out a past video that I made. That's um, me breaking down successful authors and how they use their books to, to capitalize on it. Courtney Mom probably being the example that comes to mind the most. She wrote a book, a lot of books actually, all fiction, and then used her experience in the traditional publishing arm, wrote a book about her experience and what to know called Before and After the Book Deal. And then I guess a lot of people really liked it. And so now she offers you know, book coaching services. She does editing services. She hosts writing retreats and stuff. She's got a lot of cool stuff going on. So you should check her out for ideas if you're maybe more in the uh, in the fiction space. But, you know, generally, that's, these are all things that you have to think about. When you decide to write a book, you are going into business with yourself and your materials. You're going into business. You're becoming an entrepreneur when you write a book. It might seem a little big, especially if you're starting out and you're in that rom romanticizing type of phase, but it's very, very true. Depending on what your goals are, what your version of success is, even if you just decide to do it yourself through self-publishing, you're going into business with yourself because you have something to promote and market and sell and get money for it in exchange. So here's what I, if I, based on everything that's been said, and I know that this is a bit of a longer video, but based on everything that I've said, if I had to start over this is what I would do. I would probably spend the first chunk, however long I want, really, there's no timeline on this, just building up my brand awareness and my platform so that by the time I have something to sell, I don't have to market me and the book. I just have the book to market to a pre-existing audience. So it's really easy to go through the whole book publishing process and market at the end. But in my opinion, it should sort of be tacked on on either end of the timeline, right? Because in the beginning, you're marketing yourself, you're building up your following, you're doing all that stuff. You go through the book process. When you have a book to promote, you already have a group of people to promote it to, right? So specifically, here's what that would look like. Feel free to take notes if you want. Number one, I'm going to identify my niche. How am I placing myself? How specific am I getting? What do I want people to associate with me? Right now, it's the business of books the book to brand pipeline, right? This all is under the marketing umbrella in my mind. So marketing is a very, very big space. That's kind of like the corner that I've carved out for myself. Number two, once I define my niche, I want to define my target audience. These are the people that feel like they resonate with you, that get a lot of questions answered by you. These are the people that you eventually want to grow into your thousand true fans. If you haven't heard that theory, you can Google it. It was written on a blog in like 02 or something like that, but it's the thousand true fans theory is basically a thousand people that are gonna follow you anywhere and be your amplifiers. They're the ones that are gonna bring in other people. They're sort of like your street team, right? They're like, this person is awesome. Oh my God, they're so amazing. You're gonna love everything that you do because nothing is more powerful than word of mouth, marketing 101. <laughs> Number three, I'm going to clarify my ideal platforms. I believe in going deeper rather than wider. I don't think you need to be everywhere all at once. I would pick one or two different platforms, whether it be a blog, a podcast, a newsletter, any of the social bajillion social media platforms that are out there. Maybe pick one or two, play around, see what kind of responses that you're getting and start building up your following. I built up my YouTube channel in about a year. I, I think I went from about 300 subscribers to 1200 in less than a year initially just by posting shorts. I was making reels on my Instagram. I was downloading them to my phone and then very, very passively just uploading them to YouTube because I already had them and why not? And then I saw that I started growing a following on there and then I started playing around with long form videos, testing out that niche that I assigned myself with, the business of books. It seemed to have gotten a lot of receptivity and attention from people. So now that's kind of what I do and I try to improve the quality over time. So that's an example of what I did. Number four is gonna be start building up that platform. Once you're kind of getting an idea of what's working, maybe what's not working, the fastest way to grow a following is through cross promotion. So think about who you know, what kinds of platforms they have. If there's any kind of overlap between what you do and what they do, that's a great way to uh, build up your following. Number five, over time, you're gonna start fine tuning that brand. You're gonna start implementing feedback that you get from people, taking a look at your analytics and your data in the back end to see what the numbers are telling you because the numbers don't lie, they only need context. Data can be so, so powerful because they have a lot of hidden answers inside. What is people's retention like? How long do they watch the average video? Why did you have that big bump in unsubscribers or in new subscribers? What happened, right? Just keeping a monthly beat on that to fine tune your message, your branding, your approach, your tone, your style, your personality, all that stuff. Number six is gonna be based on all of that, which can take X number of time. There's really no timeline on that. Start outlining your book 
based on what people are telling you, right? Because people want to read books that resonate with them. What better way to create a quality piece of material by using what people are telling you, right? This is market feedback can be so, so powerful, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, what people like, what people don't like, start incorporating that into like a loose outline. And then from there, you can start the writing and the editing and the publishing and all that stuff. And then at the very end, when you do have a book to promote, it's written in the language of the people that you attracted. That's why I say that this whole thing is very, very cyclical, right? It's like the chicken and the egg. Do you write a book to gain an audience or do you need an audience to gain a book? Start with one and it'll help get you the other. It all boils down to consistency and being able to practice a flexible growth mindset, especially when we start getting into the business of books. So I know that was a lot of information. There's always a lot to talk about. If there are any specific questions that you have for me, please drop them in the comments below. I really try to keep a beat on new comments and people tuning in. So definitely leave your thoughts below. I hope you got something out of this video. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing. Let's other people know that it's worth their time and attention because that is a very, very valuable asset. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for hanging around. If you've watched it through to the end. Um, take care. See you next time. Bye.